everybody, welcome. And this is being recorded. If I did it right, it's being recorded. So welcome to our artist talk today between Claire Rosen and Yelena Stroykin, two of the artists exhibiting in our exhibition, Fabled Flora, in addition to Julie McLaurin and Robert Langham, who are also part of the exhibition. And Fabled Flora, the exhibition we have in our gallery runs from February 19th through April 16th here in Houston, Texas. And this exhibition is a little unique. It's a celebration and a challenge to the historical and current perceptions and misperceptions of still lifes as a genre, as an art form that, and its importance and its use for expression. Now, the two folks joining me, the two artists joining us in this talk today, Claire Rosen. Claire is an internationally recognized and collected artist and speaker. She's also lectured. She has several different portfolios. So Still Lives is one part of that, but she has a fascination with the natural world and the ideals of beauty. Much of her work creates a dialogue around the need for animal advocacy and environmental conservation. Um, you see in her work like Fantastical Feasts. And her work has won several awards and recognitions. I'll embarrass her for a minute. The Prix de la Photographie and the Sony World Awards. And she's also a brand ambassador for Fujifilm and Hanamule. And Claire also is the author of a book, Imaginarium, which is the process behind pictures and artistic practices. She's a graduate of SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design in Bard. Our other guest speaker is Yelena Sreiken. She is an artist who has very solidly embraced the still life genre and many of her portfolios that she has besides one we'll be showing and images are a celebration of nature and food. She's formerly a photojournalist and a travel photographer and has traveled the world. And she's a brilliant self-taught photographer. I also found out in getting to know her that in addition to being a photographer, she's a food stylist, has a passion for fine cuisine and presentation, which I do too. And she's a great food blog. And she's done over 500 recipes, by the way, just FYI. So she's a world traveler influenced by learning things as she's gone amongst different people and cultures and that shows up in her work, by the way. And she's received multiple recognitions for her work, including a Sony World Photography Awards, Julia Margaret Cameron, Polux, and other domestically and internationally. And her compositions are really thought out arrangements using natural light, heavily influenced by her study of Rembrandt, literally traveling to Amsterdam, by the way, to be in a studio and see how his windows and lights actually work, following the practices of old masters, unaltered by post-production practices that, you know, it's so prevalent in today's work. She's very much a purist and a traditionalist in her approach. But her series, Off-White, which we'll be seeing today, is a departure from much of the work that she's done before and very different in terms of lighting, texture, complexity, and presentation. So with that, we'll shift and we'll start with a few images of the exhibition and then to Claire, who will start the dialogue. And if you notice at the bottom of your screen, so those of you who are new to this, you can, uh, there should be a Q&A button and we'll be monitoring that through the discussion. So uh, if you have questions and please have questions um, and we would like to leave a little time at the end for questions, um, please put it in the Q&A if you would. There's also a chat feature if you direct questions specifically to one person or another, but it's better to put it in the Q&A, I think. So um, with that, Claire, um, why don't we move to your first image and lead us through the discussion, the thoughts behind your work. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction and for having me and hosting this beautiful show uh, in Houston, which I'm disappointed to not see in person, but have been pleased to experience it through pictures. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in this evening. Um, I thought I would start with just a very brief background of um, traditional Dutch master still lifes, the topic, um, the genre of which 
Ileana and I are both um, very inspired by. And it's interesting to me that while it's like wildly popular during its heyday and continues to be, it historically was very low on the sort of hierarchy rung of art um, as uh, critics didn't think that there was a terrible amount of value in it in, as compared to the sort of history paintings which were at the top of the hierarchy and portraiture and landscape. Um, still lives were sort of at the bottom. Nonetheless, they were just sought after and many artists actually noted that they felt that it was more difficult to make a captivating still life than it was to do um, a flattering portrait, which I thought was sort of interesting. And the just range of genres that you find in still life um, from floral arrangements, fruit, vegetables, to game, uh, kitchen utensils. There's an entire genre of just mushroom paintings and um, ones that focus on nature and um, lizards and insects and snakes of that nature. So um, I think it's sort of interesting to look at historically what was going on at the time um, in the Netherlands was uh, sort of breaking away from Spain and was a huge uh, port trade. They had a booming economy and these still lives were commissioned as a sign of status and wealth. And what I think is sort of interesting about that is the sort of juxtaposition of the embedded meaning that is found in almost all still lives. The consistency among all the genres really speaks to um, embedding objects with symbolism and meaning. And most of them are sort of cautionary tales to some extent that they warn of abundance of impertinence of um, uh, of all the ills of society, yet they really featured costly, luxurious items that people that commissioned them showed off the treasures that they had. So there's this interesting juxtaposition between the, um, the sort of warning fabled of them, which was highly influenced by uh, Catholicism and Christianity at the time and those sort of morals and values. So you sort of have to look at still lives in that context and then all the people that have been influenced by that um, coming down the line. Um, for me, personally, this is interesting. I have never presented my still lives before because as Jeffrey mentioned, I have a sort of wide collection of work and still lives for me are the things that I do um, when I want to be more meditative, when I want to spend time alone in the studio, usually very late at night, um, fussing with objects and, and as opposed to um, sort of my other work, which is a bigger production value, wrangling all types of animals and creating big tables for them or sort of whimsical fairy tale images. Um, but I bring them up because I think there's an interesting connection between the two of them. My career started with work based and influenced very strongly by fairy tales. So I think that correlation of the sort of allegoric, allegorical story or the warning of, um, of bad behavior and the um, reward of good behavior, I think is a thread that follows through both the sort of fairy tale work and this later still life work. Um, so maybe we can go to the next picture. Um, so for me, what I also think is very interesting and Ileana maybe you can um, tell me that many people look at these historical references and are influenced that, by them in so many different ways. Um, and I know that there are some artists that try to sort of faithfully reproduce the masters of the past. But in my case, I sort of try and think about the aesthetic and the world and the symbols that were used then to create my own pictures. And I think that you do the same thing as opposed to trying to recreate them very faithfully. Um, but there's just um, 
a very interesting progression of symbols that uh, while I think a lot of them remain very universal, you have different cultural symbols that come into play. And I sort of love the idea that you can hide these little secrets and messages within the work and that it will mean something very different to me than it will mean to somebody that's viewing. Well, let me ask you a question though on that, because you and I, this particular image, you and I have had several discussions about, and so the people watching will notice that we've got a fang extended rattlesnake in the lower right. And of course, and I think uh, talking about a little bit about the snake, why the snake is there, the nature of the flowers, the if we could maybe discuss that. Sure. Um, and this is one of my favorite pictures in the um, in the series. And I know that um, it was a bit controversial because of the aggressive nature of the yeah. rattlesnake that is peeking right out of the frame. But for me, this picture is really about duality um, and and light and darkness as it exists in life in so many ways. Um, there's a beautiful uh, Latin, I'm not gonna say it in Latin cause I'll ruin it, but um, there's a beautiful quote from 1590 Camarus that says, I, in, in reference specifically to tulips that I wither when the sun is hidden. Um, and I loved the idea of these yellow um, variegated vein tulips just uh, sort of drooping in the darkness but emitting their own golden glow. And as you know, the tulip craze in Holland, these flowers are very prevalent through the floral still life tradition for their um, reference to transience and beauty and like fleeting beauty. Um, and as this was a spring show, the tulip is also one of the first flowers to bring us out of winter's darkness each spring. Um, and I love the sort of visual of the cycles of um, the sun coming up and them coming up and them coming down. Uh, and then also in this picture, you will notice um, some moths flying about. And I loved that they were sort of drawn like a moth to the flame to this golden um, tulip and moths are always sort of in the darkness and they fly around at night and they have a very fleeting existence of just six days. I don't think they even eat during that time, but. Um, but this yeah. brings me into the moral lessons that, you know, what, I think it was you who mentioned this to me or somewhere I read it about um, in the 1600s, I guess when still lives really came into the fore, the, not just everybody owned a still life. It was something that only certain people had because of the lessons that were embedded in these. So I think that's something that both of you have done with your work. Well, it was the emerging merchant class that commissioned most of them as they had this newfound wealth status and mm -hmm. that it was part of the trading thing and that they were also, you know, in the trade of objects and in, in the trade of exotic and rare objects. And those were commonly, um, showcased in this work. But uh, there's sort of some that are more warnings about von, the sort of abundance and overindulgence and like gluttony of life uh, and that you shouldn't pay too much attention to things that are not important. And then there are the ones that remind us that time is fleeting, which also reinforce this idea that you shouldn't focus on material objects because you have a short time on this earth. Um, and then the snake is a very powerful and poignant symbol that you find throughout art history. It really shows up in this reoccurring way. Um, and it's, it's, it's a complicated symbol because of its representation of both good and evil. Um, and that it represents sort of like deep intrinsic wisdom and knowledge, but also the sort of darkness of the fall from grace. And I think that people are, either captivated by snakes or repulsed by them, or the sometimes at the same time, you can sort of have that duality of, of feeling. Um, but they also um, represent the endless cycle of life. So I, I appreciated the snake coming to sort of um, devour this unsuspecting moth kind of creep, keeping this life cycle, ongoing cycle of death, decay and rebirth over and over like this.
cycles of the sun that are the sort of rhythms that our lives march to. And you also provided some images that were inspirational to you, I think. Yeah, you can, thank you. Go to the next slide. This is a an artist from the 17th century that actually really pioneered this genre of, um, they called them forest floor still lives. And they, they illustrated the sort of underlayer of of wild places and the insects that could be found there you know with it was really a rise in science that um, amplified a lot of the still lives because people were be becoming more and more interested in natural history and actually a lot of the still life painters of the time were um endlessly fascinated by um, cabinets of curiosity, collecting these insects and these lizards. And many of them were scientists also at the same time and did those botanical demonstrative illustrations. And then they made their way into these uh, paintings as representations of the entire ecosystem. Um, so the floral still life genre, this is just a kind of funny inside joke for me. When I um, moved to uh, Pennsylvania and I was doing still lives, a um, friend pointed out that there was the painter that lived here in the um, 19th century, Severin Rosen, whose name is spelled like similarly to mine. Um, and he had a, and he was based in this air local to this area. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see an example of his work. Uh, so I was sort of inspired and um, and just intrigued by the idea that someone was making still lives later in this area and that uh, we were not related, but that we had a similar name. So I have used some of his work as a sort of starting point for uh, images of my own. Um, but one cool thing about floral still lives that um, I think is really interesting is, as I research more and more of, about them, is that often they included flowers that could never at the time have bloomed at the same time. Like now, we sort of take for granted that we can get any type of flower, any type of any time of the year, which is sort of n newer to uh, to us, but um, historically, these flowers would not have bloomed at the same time. And so it was to prove that the bouquet could have never existed. And it was like a feat of um, a feat of the artist's uh, interpretation to be able to get all of these like impossible bouquets to um, exist. Go to the next one. And then the table still life. So I'm trying to just show a variety of the different genres. Um, and uh, it's interesting, I think, um, Ileana, one of the things that I had hoped to ask you was if you had any um, sort of hacks for getting the really great lemon peels, which you find as a constant in these table settings, because I have not been able to get it down, but I noticed that you had some really lovely ones in some of your uh, you. darker work. And I was wondering if you had any tips on how to get those so perfectly. Of course, we share some secrets between girls. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> after the zoom um but again yeah, the the rotting fruit the the decaying browning of things all representing that time will pass and all things are perishable and 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 um sort of the abundance of things as they decay um and this sort of suspension of reality in terms of the planes of the plates sort of coming off the table this is um this is something that happens quite frequently in the tradition. If you go to the next uh, slide, Susanna, thank you. You will see, and in many table settings, that they are these sort of spontaneous moments where the plate seems to come towards the viewer as if welcoming them to the table. Although all of them seem to be impossible, like they're not table settings that you just came upon. They was like great skill 
went into creating these compositions that would drive your eye around and that all the objects would relate to each other in, in some sense. Um, the insects all had meetings, the fruits typically represented sort of the Garden of Eden, um, and uh, cheese could represent local industry uh, and dairy um, the, of the region. So in Holland, you see a lot of dairy <laughs> portrayed because they had a lot of national pride about that. Um, and, then, and then things that just also demonstrated the artist's skill level. Um, and I would say one of the, sorry, no, no, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there was a question that just popped up that fits exactly with what you're saying. And the question is, do you use someone to do the setting for you or styling, or do you style the settings in your images yourself? Which I thought was very interesting. It's a great question. And I love still lives because I can do them completely by myself. Um, and they don't require like a lot of energy. But one of the, I would say the big challenges of still life photography and um, maybe you'll agree with me is to create a composition that doesn't feel static that doesn't feel dead that has even though it's a still light like that has some life to it that has uh, an almost inarticulable x factor that draws you in that you can't stop looking at it that there's something unexpected about it that that pulls you in further that it's it's not just a picture of flowers. It's not um, just a table of fruit. And I think that it, it is very difficult to really hone in on what makes something like, because the difference can be so small, right? It can be like moving something a quarter of an inch and suddenly it clicks and there's a tension between the objects and your eye can travel around freely and you just get pulled in and it feels natural to some extent, even though these are not natural scenes, any of them, they feel like they were meant to be. There's like a, a believability of them, for lack of a better word, that exists. And I think that that's the big, big challenge of, um, of this genre. Well, I think also, like this image, there's a contrast between what you've done here and the one you had done prior to this last image. And you do embed little mysteries in them, like in the very first image, the crab, and the one we had just seen, the wasp, you know. And each of those have a meaning for you or a traditional meaning. Definitely. And I think um, currently the thing that's interesting is to sort of like look at the messages and then translate in a contemporary sense, how, how are they applicable now? Like why is this still interesting to look at, which I think is always important that you're not just sort of reproducing this trope over and over again or this piece of history without adding any new context to it. Um, so when I think about the objects on the table and for this image in particular, for me, it really makes me think about our current food systems and, and using the sort of symbolism and the meaning behind like, you know, the being wary of abundance and greed and not being thoughtful and, you know, impertinence that, you know, I've put on this table in particular food from every single season, you know, the, there's, um, there's melons that are from the summer, they're from all different regions also. Um, and one big interest area of interest for me is, um, is conservation and our relationship to our food systems and growing food responsibly and sustainably. So um, being able to relate it back to sort of agricultural concepts now, I think gives it a whole new meaning and dialogue and conversation past what it historically would have meant. So it's like serving its purpose as, you know, these paintings historically were meant to spark conversation and they were meant to spark dialogue. They weren't put in people's dining rooms. They were put in people's libraries because they were to have this intellectual conversation. So I think it's very interesting to be able to continue a contemporary conversation using the aesthetics and the sort of architecture of this genre um, to talk about 
insect decline as I have in some of my pictures to, and again, this food systems where we've gone so far from like local seasonal growing um, and the implications that that has globally uh, for our climate and, and beyond. And, um, our and th there was another question that came up that I wanted to ask because, and, and Yale and I'm gonna ask you this same thing or speak to it, I'm sure, which is lighting. Um, Lighting is so important in, in your lighting, hers, it'll be interesting to discuss the contrast, but maybe Clara comment on your view of the lighting of your pieces, use of light. Sure, well, obviously the aesthetics are very driven by the art history and the pieces that existed. And, um, you know, they use a beautiful diffused directional light and things emerging from the shadows just gives it such a, like a glow and, and a mystery. And I think it, it embeds sort of ordinary objects with a bit more gravitas for like lack of a better word. But um, so I have done a couple with natural light using window light, but I have found that because I, work much better at night as a night owl. I have, I do do them with strobe lighting and I use a one softbox setup, which uh, is reminiscent of, of window light. And I try to just sort of kiss the objects with it, but not light anything directly. But I am again, always um, trying to think about shape and mood and tone when I'm, when I'm making this work. Good. Um, I don't have a terrible, huge amount to say about this one, but um, it's sort of, uh, you do see some references of live animals that peek into still life scenes. So this is just an, another sort of example of this sweet um, calf that was very uh, generously, um, a neighbor allowed me to come and and photograph this calf who was born during the height of COVID and didn't didn't take to his mother, so he was you know being taken care of. Um, but I just again thinking back to like how we get our food and this sort of nostalgic pastoral ideal of like that we used to really understand where our food came from and being more responsible about. Um, about agriculture is what this picture means to me. And uh, it just, you know, the work is always influencing each other. Like everything you do has an impact on the work that you make. So my feast project, which is animals eating big dinners, you know, this obviously has um, a little bit of a relationship to that as I love working with animals. Um, so this is like, I just had the one little guy. <laughs> so. yeah, well, lovely image, thank you. So as, as we move on, uh, do we shift to Yelena's work here? And we'll notice right away some differences in the approach. So Yelena, will you please, uh, let's talk about your still life work and, and the contrast between your work, Claire's work and what motivates you in doing your work. Um, actually, I like to start uh, talking about my previous collection because that is going to lead to my off-white collection. Uh, my previous collection, yes, this is my first image of still life, which I took a few years ago. And this is um, how my still life uh, interest um, starts. When I looked at the, this image, I realized this is what I love to do. And I see myself um, in that image. I see my old soul and I see uh, old world. So, and uh, this is how my um, glimpse through the Flemish window starts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it, it's similar to um, Claire, I love the table set up, I love the fruits and vegetables, and of course I agree with everything what she said. Um, we, uh, we do use a lot of symbolism in our pictures and we create a story, and actually this is what I do with my pictures, I create the stories. Um, uh, why still life? Still life is, um, 
as a photographer, when you're using still life genre, you not only can capture the image, but you can create a moment yourself. And um, this is what I'm actually doing. I'm uh, creating a feeling with my still lives. It's not just the beautiful objects for me to, uh, which I put together. Um, it's, it's more than that. It's when you look at it and um, you can um, see the fresh um, baked bread and you can remember your grandmother or um, something pop ups in your memory, you know, something dear to you. And um, also in my um, pictures, there are a lot of little hints and a lot of um, gems and mysteries that I, you know, I hide. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you, yeah, if you look close enough, you can find them and you can feel them. Um, you can um create your own story sort of speak you know like ah what is it you know this is like why is it a watch here why is it this mm -hmm. um or, like for example this one this uh this uh picture is called um uh a long winter it represents a time <laughs> actually right about right now uh, when we have a very, very long winter and we read all the books, we ate all pomegranates, our, our fresh flowers already dried up and we all ready for a spring, for a new start, from new, uh, for a new beginning in our lives. And this is just that before the spring comes. So um, this is a story and... Um, uh, I like to create it. I, yeah. I create with my energy, with my eyes, with my visions. Sometimes it takes me a um, couple of months just to think about what do I want to say and how do I want to show this to uh, people and how can they feel it. And then I start to work and start to set up my table. I'm because I don't use Photoshop, um, to me, it's very uh, important to do everything right and place everything precisely where I feel like it should be. So, um, and sometimes it takes me up to 100 images just to produce the right image where it's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, so this is my collection of um, before of white, and uh, um, it brings beauty to the world. This is my intention of this collection, and the most importantly, traditions. Um, I don't want people to forget where we come, where we come from, who are our ancestors, who, who, where our parents come from, what kind of traditions they had. So I try to also put this in my pictures and bring this beauty of the old world to the new generation and to share it with modern world. Um, so basically to bring it <laughs> to, the next, to, the, to the next time, you know? And um, uh, yes, so, and then um, all white collection came. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's completely different from what I used to do. So um, what is it about? It's, it's about everything. <laughs> it's about life itself, basically. And I use only few um, objects in every picture um, because I wanted to be uh, minimal, uh, minimalistic in this work. 
um, I feel like everything genius in life, it's very, very simple, but you need to find the um, right position and right object to show it. And this is what basically all about. And um, I think, I think I nailed this. <laughs> this is how I feel about that. Like, if you look at this one, it, it, it has an absolutely deep meaning. Um, uh, I have a branch with um, uh, organic apple from my garden. And when you look at it, it's, it's not that beautiful, you know, it's uh, not around, uh, not red or anything, but it's organic, it's come from the nature. And the red apple uh, sitting gorgeously on a white plate, it's a store-bought apple, you know, it's, it's perfect in every way you can look at it. So it's completely two different concepts. It's uh, two different apples, you know? <laughs> So, and the rest of it's up to you. What do you think about this? Like how you feel about that? Um, I always uh, like to um, not finish the story when I, when I talk at my presentations, at my shows, I always let the ending kind of leave it to people to think, uh, like what do they wanna think? You know, so this is up to them. Continue with your story yourself. Um, I love that. I think that people really enjoy work that challenges them, that they don't have all the questions answered for them. And I think that's a really beautiful point to make um, that you give the viewer room to participate and engage with your work. I think it's fat. I mean, I think there's an instinct to want to like tell everything. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I want to speak a little bit why it's uh, of white collection. Um, if you put all images together, you can see how white is different in every image, although the ground is the same, some objects are the same, uh, the fabric on the table is the same. Uh, it's different every time because I shoot it in a different time of day. And um, it's all about perspective, like how we look at things. Uh, and everybody has its own universe and we're looking from, you know, our own lives and we can see probably the same thing completely, completely different. So this, of, I didn't do white balance uh, the same for um, all these pictures specifically because I wanted to show how white can be not white and how it can be different, you know? So um, it's also something to think about as a collection, as a, uh, as a whole collection. I have about 20 images in this collection and um, uh, we can move to the next one. Um, uh -huh. uh, this is also, um, the fig from the garden and but he, uh, actually it's interesting because uh, uh, pre previous um, image with the apple has the same teapot but completely different feel because a completely different white you know so that is <laughs> that is mystery here as well and in the next image um I moved a little bit from off white and I wanted to put um, different colors. Uh, and this is the same branch with the same apple, but apple already rottening. So it's um, already like going to the next stage of life. And I have I have cicadas here, which you cannot see right away, but if you, you know, get into the image, get to know the image, you will see it's two cicadas sitting there. 
And they also represent the circle of life. <laughs> like Claire said, you know, they born, they die, they come from that shell, you know, that they amazing creatures. And I actually, I have a whole box of shells from Cicada. And <laughs> every time I show somebody, they jump, <laughs> but I love it so much, you know, I collect them myself. So this, this is also have a very deep meaning. And this is what I tried to do here with just a few objects to create a story and make the viewer uh, think um, about life, uh, about death, about why we're here, about what are we doing, about beauty, what do we leave behind? Um, Yeliana, there's a question I have because one of the things right. that I really like this in your other prior images that you showed us, you had the watch, the mm -hmm. clock, the little mm -hmm. clock, you know, which to me, of course, is passage of time that you're indicating. Right, right. Clock is image, always ticking. It's always ticking. <laughs> I know, I know. It's time to <laughs> passing, whether we want it to or not. Right. In this image, though, I and I just noticing this now is how you have the leaves have fallen off the branches. To me, I don't know if you intended that as a substitute for the passage of time. Of course, uh, watch is, uh, watch is uh, a really obvious thing, you know? Yeah, right. So why not to take um, one more step deeper <laughs> and you know, uh, put it under a little bit of veil. So again, to something to think about because watch, yes, you instantly see the watch, you instantly think, oh yeah, time is ticking, you know? So it's very understandable. Here, it's uh, your mind kind of flowing, like, yeah, you have a rotten apple, you know, you have cicadas, you have few leaves. You know, so, but it's, it's, it's not about the end of things. It's about circle of life. You know, it's, you also have to understand that it's not about just something dying, you know, mm -hmm. it's about creation itself. Uh, it's about what will be born, of, uh, bo born after that, you know, and Go on and go on and go on. So, but a very good catch. Yes, leaves definitely represent, representing something interesting here. Can I ask you a question? Sure. I just wonder, because as I'm thinking about it, I'm listening, so much of what you're saying is resonating. And I'm wondering, do you feel like the study of still lives and as you make them have sort of changed your perspective on how you live your life and like the sort of, um, mindset that you have and, um, you know, maybe does it, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, um, I'm just wondering if you feel like it's affected your sort of point of view or perspective, given all this, um, reinforcement of the cycle of life and time passing and, and beauty decay, all of the things, um, um, of course, and uh, of course, absolutely, um, my work is changing through the time and so am I. And as much as I'm changing, my work is changing. So, and you can see from my early work, how, uh, what I have, and you have a certain feelings from my er earlier collections, but now it's a um, it's little bit different and, uh, um, uh, I yes, it is. It is the development, and but in the many ways, not only art, not only photography, but also um, inside myself. You can know, I, can I follow up. This on is, that? Mm, oh, mm? I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt. Yeah. No, but to okay. follow up on that because it was a great question. But in the very first slide, we had mm -hmm. this skull. Right. And, I know you like and, this image very much. <laughs> and, well, you see it in some still lives. Right. And in this one, particularly, where before you have dishes and things like that, here we have a skull, an egg, and a right. green leaf. 
would you speak, I mean, following Claire's question, I mean, when you see this, I mean, in what in the case we just saw in the slide, we just saw, you know, you changed the uh, utensils and the plates from white right. to black here. This is very different than those. It's different, but it's uh, kind of the same. Uh, it fits the feel, it fits the collection. This is basically uh, um, life as we know from the beginning to the end. Uh, you have an egg, which is, represents the life itself, the birth, the, and you have a skull, which is also, um, you know, uh, it's a spirit and you, um, which um, I don't want to call it that it represents death or anything, but you know, the end of the journey. How about that? I, uh, you know, I like that much better. And a green leaf between, which is, you know, life itself, how it's blooming, how it's growing, how it's green and goes to the sky, it's looking up to the sun and all that. And with this three simple um, objects, you can, you can see the whole thing. You can see this whole circle of life. So I think it fits. Um, uh, and uh, um, I, I use skulls a lot in my work because I like nature. Um, I, I collect them in the woods or somewhere I can find it. Of course, nobody harm ever um, when I creating my images. Even butterflies I find, or like um, bugs or anything, I never would ever <laughs> kill anybody or like dry anybody. So it's all gifts from the nature to me, and I using them, honoring uh, the life, giving them a second um, life in my creations. This is what that's why I'm using and, this. And and. The I literally, now that you described it, I mean, literally see a circle of life in front mm -hmm. of me. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. following it around now and I can't get that vision out of my head. But there was a question that was asked by someone and the contrast between your work and Claire's brings this question to the fore is, how do you, how much time do you, really, you spend, you know, when you're thinking about the images, creating the images, their question is kind of like, how much time do you spend thinking about it ahead of time, how long does it take you to set it up? Or is it more intuitive that you get into it? And, and you know, where Claire has more complex images, yours are very minimalist, as you said. I'd like to hear, and I think it's a good question, is how do you both approach, you know, how much time is it taking to really develop what you're trying to say in these images and set it up? Uh, my dark collection, um, uh, e it took me months and months for every image. It sometimes I create it in my sleep. Uh, how long I created this collection of white collection, you could say it's a work of about four years, but inside of me, you know, and when it's when it was show up in me it was easy to do. I was ready to make it, but to get to it, it was a very, very long road, yes. So it's, like I said, it's not just things you, oh, I decided to put couple things together. It, it's not that, it's much deeper, much, um, it's a lot of inner work, I think, you know. So it's, it's a long road. <laughs> Yeah, and Claire? I mean, I would sort of echo that sentiment that the aesthetics and the things that you're drawn to and the questions that you have develop over a lifetime. It's sort of the journey of being an artist and you know, you're know, you this amalgamation of everything you've seen and everything you're doing, your subconscious and um, versus saying like, you know, I spent two hours moving objects around on a table. Like, I think, you can't just have the two hours that you spend moving the pictures around, the like physical objects around. It really, to be able to do that takes, as um, Ileana beautifully said, your whole life <laughs> to come to this point. Um, no, I think that's great. Great. Answer. 
And then I think um, well, there's another slide of uh, Yeliana's work. If we can go to that, that was passed. Yeah, if we go through. Wait, because I went there. No, next one. Was there a next one? Ah, I thought that was it. So. What good timing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we can open it up for questions. There were a few questions during it, and I wanted to see uh, what are the questions our audience might have for us in this. But we can give them a, a minute. Um, I want to go back, Claire, uh, I mean, Yeliana, to your shift to off-white from the classic Rembrandt look you had studied so much. Good, I want to know about I, I'm sorry? Good, good, I want to know about this too. Yeah, right. because I mean, you made a point when we've been talking about you use natural light. Yes. And you mentioned different times of the day. Not even yeah. that, different time of the year and different okay. time of the day of the different time of the year. And you can tell, uh, I can tell, and it, uh, when was it shot by me because it gives a um, specific feel. So um, it's important to me. I went to Holland, Amsterdam and visit Rembrandt studio, Rembrandt house. I always um, fascinated to see how they have a light. Um, you know, where they created. And um, it was very interesting to walk around and see where the light come from and how shadows, shadows, uh, you, you know, falling. So it's, um, it really helped. Um, also, I study a lot of still lives uh, from Flemish period into museums. Every country, every city I've been, I went to art museum. It's, um, at one point, uh, my family was like, oh, no more museums, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, uh, you know, because of that, my daughter um, loved, uh, start to loving art and start to go museum herself. And I bought her um, a membership to art museum in Philadelphia so she can visit by herself. So it, it's all good. Um, yeah, it's, we got a couple of other good questions. Claire, did that, was that your answer question too? Did that cover what you were wondering about her use of light or did you want to elaborate on yours? Um, I guess I was, I, I was wondering if it was sort of a gradual progression or if all at once you were like, I'm going, I have this, like, how did the idea come to pass? Was it like you were starting to make lighter images or did you wake up one day and you were like, I know exactly it's gotta be white and it's gonna be white. I'm gonna use these white things. Um, it was a period after um, uh, dark, it was a period greenish, uh, like I have greenish background. I do backgrounds myself. I sparkle, I, you know, uh, when, I, when I say I do everything myself, it's, <laughs> It's literally, this is what I do. I bake bread, I cook for my images. I, um, uh, I hardly buy any groceries at the store because I wanted to um, see, uh, I, I wanted to look uh, authentic as possible. And it was a period when I had um, greenish background, greenish, um, um, still lives so it was a little bit lighter than dark so it's kind of like I, I coming out gradually from um uh dark pictures and white um i guess it was just time to do white on white so i guess it came to that point yeah. you know to do that i in fact that's a good segue into a question that was asked is it necessary to see the collection as a whole, to fully understand the passage of time cycle of life theme? No, not, not really. You can take this one image, uh, which is on the screen and you already can tell a great story. Yes, it's, um, it's not like it's continue from one to another. It's, you can take 
any image and basically you will have elements from this or that. So yeah. I have a question from for Claire. Um, yeah. I noticed that you use so many animals and so many interesting um, live creatures, which I love. How do you make them stay still and <laughs> and pose for you and smile for your camera. Can you please tell me? Well, I mean, that is one of the benefits of being a photographer over a painter is that you don't need them to stay still for very long, uh, which I definitely benefited from. But um, I mean, I'm just captivated by the natural world and um, I will do whatever I can to, to be around uh, these creatures. Um, but moving to the my f new farm in Pennsylvania has really opened up my animal game, as they say, from I'm sure I'm sure wildlife yeah. around. Uh, I've had frogs actually just hop into the studio um, <laughs> by accident. <laughs> and they were, um, you know, invited to come sit on a still life for a moment and then, you know, put back in the garden. But um, Hopefully they weren't too nervous about it. Uh, I think they were. Uh -huh. but but, that, oh, sorry. That, no, I was that goes, go ahead. Uh, no, it just, and uh, there's so many lovely neighbors here that have, that have animals um, that have made their way to me. That's that is good. wonderful. That, that is wonderful. Because that, that le leads to another question that was here. That's very good. It says, does either photographer see a difference between a par painter's approach to still life and the approach with a camera? And I want to add to that because of what you said. I mean, a still life, nature more, you know, the term still life literally, and we've talked about this, meant death, a dead nature, still nature. Yeah. Not always though, because they were so interested in biology and in um, like natural world. So a lot of them collected insects, they collected birds. So they're like that, um, so I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the stubascuro, the, the, the floor of the forest. Mm -hmm. Those are sort of live animals versus kind of the game and food ones that did feature dead animals and um, I do sometimes use a little bit of taxidermy, ethically sourced taxidermy in some of the images because they okay. feel a little bit better than uh, the real ones. Um, but do you do, do you do it yourself or? Um... You know, I tried once and I have to say I have no future in that medicine or serial killing um, because I didn't have the, I like admire people that can do it, but wow, hard, hard to do. It is, yeah, it's also not for me. No, no, I love the nature too much and I, I, I cannot, yeah. But all of my taxidermy comes mostly from um, either it's antique or it's uh, like roadkill. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and I'm going to have to apologize in advance to because there are several questions that came in. Uh, okay. We're not going to have time to get to all of them, but I do want to ask. Um, there's one here, Claire, and they must have something about your other work too that says they ask. I wanted to ask you if there is any particular fairy tale that inspires you in your work, and I'm thinking it has to be how it influences your still lives. But. So many. Um... It would be hard to pick just one, especially one that would influence a still life. I mean, well, one of my favorite ones is actually the 12 dancing princesses. And um, because they would like um, every night go and dance holes in their shoes in the evening and their father had no idea what had happened. And I don't know if that's just cause I have four sisters or, um, and we were like naughty teenagers or if, um, but they, they would go through these like forests of emeralds and rubies and diamonds to this lake to go dance with their uh, princes all evening. And I, I love the visuals of them like going through this forest. And, and I guess with my object obsession, I love the idea of the shoes worn and tattered from like a life well lived. So I suppose I should make a shoe still life. 
That would be awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, here's and here's one last question. We'll go with this last question. Do you leave your still life up for a certain amount of time and live with them and see more if, or do you feel that becomes more, and do you feel if it becomes more enriched if you do that? It's mm, a great question. Good question to finish, yeah. Um, if I'm able to, I do think, again, just emphasizing that passage of time as things wilt, decay, brown a little bit, I think it can become more interesting. Um, I would say it's certainly situational. Um, but uh, one of the things that you called out in Yiliana's photo with the leaves dropping and the beautiful, like, yeah, the, have, yeah. the imperfection in an image is something that can, again, help achieve that indescribable something that makes it special. So I do think like the browning of fruit, the coming down of the flowers, although I have left some flower bouquets and they've just like, they completely dropped and then it was a disaster. But I, I would say situationally, it could certainly yield some interesting things. Okay. What about Yeliana? Um, some of my still lives uh, in my, earlier work had a lot of great food and um, uh, you know some of them even have uh, olives and salamis and cheese so usually when I <laughs> when I shoot that my husband around the corner waiting <laughs> and asking are you done yet are you done yet in her time <laughs> so some images and some still lives cannot be still for longer the minute i stop pushing my button <laughs> my husband <laughs> that's it that's it uh, that's <laughs> fabulous see. what a great uh, answer all yeah. right but uh, some some of them i leave it overnight and um, I like to come back in the morning to my studio and see again with my fresh eyes. And sometimes I change something and sometimes I don't. And, you know, I just want to feel it one more time. I want to see it. Sometimes I leave it for a couple of days if um, I'm not going to work right away, you know, to create next image. I can leave it for some certain time and just walk around it and feel it more. Yes. Wonderful. Well, with that, we'll bring it to a close. Let me thank those who've uh, joined with us very much for joining us in the session to talk about both of your works. I certainly want to warmly welcome everybody, if they're able, to come to the gallery to see the collection as well as the works of Robert Langham and Ju Julia McLaurin and uh, enjoy these still lives in person and, and study them. I do think they're all wonderful and worthy of study. So thank you so much for your time, everyone. We appreciate it. Everybody have a good evening. Thank you so and much. And go thank enjoy you. some art. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. All right.